Christ the Redeemer Anglican Church in Kennewick, Washington. We're humbly gathered here in the living room of uh, my house, and uh, we are celebrating today the triumphal entry of our Christ into the city of Jerusalem. We will be going through a little bit of the Liturgy of the Palms, appropriate for today, and then we will move into the Liturgy of the Word that we're accustomed to for this Palm Sunday. Hosanna to the Son of David and the King of Israel. Blessed, Blessed is he who comes in the name, name of the Lord. Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. highest. Dear brothers and sisters, from the beginning of Lent until now, we have been preparing our hearts by repentance and self-sacrifice. Today, the whole church, we herald the beginning of the celebration of the Paschal Mystery. On this day, our Lord Jesus entered Jerusalem and was welcomed as King with palms and shouts of praise. Today, we greet him as our King, though we know his crown and his crown of thorns and his throne a cross. Therefore, I invite you to follow our Lord this Holy Week from his triumphal entry through his suffering and death to the glory of his resurrection. The Lord be with you. And, and with your spirit. spirit. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God, of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life and immortality. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now when they knew, drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them. He will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their flock, colts, cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. And the Lord be with you. And with, with your, your spirit. spirit. Let us pray. Praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. On this day he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was hailed as king by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. Hosanna to the Son of David and the King of Israel. All, All blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest.
together. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed be our God. Now, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Together, Almighty, Almighty God, God, to you all hearts are open, open all, all desires, desires known. From you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments depend all the law of the prophets. Let us humbly confess our sins against Almighty God. Most, Most merciful, merciful God, God we, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent, with true faith turn to him, have mercy on you, and pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The Lord be with you. And, and with, with your, your spirit. spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, in your tender love for us, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering come to share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first lesson is a reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verses 13 to 53. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so mere, beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. King, Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which he has not been told, then they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that, which should, that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, 
And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he was borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for, in, for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened, he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, we considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for trans the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich men in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, was put, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offsprings. He shall prolong his days. He will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied, but his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil, the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the reading of the psalm. Today is Psalm 22, verses 1 through 11. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And are so far from my cry and from the words of my complaint. O my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear me. In the night season also, but I find no rest. But you remain holy. Enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our fathers hoped in you. They trusted in you, and you delivered them. They called upon you, and you were and they were delivered. They put their trust in you and were not confounded. But as for me, I am a worm and no man. Scorned by all and the outcast of the people. All those who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and shake their heads, saying, He trusted in God, that he would deliver him. Let, Let him deliver him, and he will have him. But you are he that took me out of my mother's womb. You are my hope when I was yet upon my mother's breast. I have been cast upon you ever since I was born. You are my God, even from my mother's womb. Oh, go not far from me, for trouble is near at hand. And, and there is none to help me. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The second lesson. Our second lesson is a reading from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. 
And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, please stand or kneel as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. Jesus was arraigned before the procurator, Pontius Pilate, who questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus responded, As you say. Yet when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he made no reply. Then Pilate said to him, Surely you hear. How many charges they bring against you? He did not answer him on a single count, much to the procurator's surprise. Now on the occasion of a festival, the procurator was accustomed to release one prisoner whom the crowd would designate. They had at the time a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. Since they were already assembled, Pilate said to them, Which one do you wish me to release for you? Barabbas, or Jesus, the so-called Messiah. He knew, of course, that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was still presiding on the bench, his wife sent him a message. Do not interfere in the case of that holy man. I had a dream about him today, which has already upset me. Meanwhile, the chief priests and elders convinced the crowds that they should ask for Barabbas and have Jesus put to death. So when the procurator asked him, which one of you do you wish me to release, they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what I am to do with Jesus, the so-called Messiah? They cried, crucify him. He said, why? What crime has he committed? But they only shouted louder, crucify him. Pilate finally realized that he was making no impression and then a riot was breaking out instead. He called for water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, declaring as he did so, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. The responsibility is yours. The whole people said in reply, Let his blood be on us and on our children. With that he released Barabbas to them. Jesus, however, he first had scourged, then he handed him over to be crucified. Procurator's soldiers took Jesus inside the praetorium and collected the whole cohort around him. They stripped off his clothes and wrapped him in a scarlet military cloak. Weaving a crown of thorns, they fixed it on his head and struck, stuck a reed in his right hand. Then they began to mock him by dropping to their knees before him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They also spat on him. Afterwards, they took hold of the reed and kept striking him on the head. Finally, when they had finished making a fool of him, they stripped him of, his, of the cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him off to crucifixion. On their way out, they met a Cyrenian named Simon. This man they pressed into service to carry the cross. Upon arriving at the site called Golgotha, a name which means skull place, they gave him a drink of wine flavored with gall, which tasted, but he refused to drink. When they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among them by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Above his head, they put the charge against him in writing, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. 
Two insurgents were crucified along with him, one his right, one at his left. People going by kept insulting him, tossing their heads and saying, So you are the one who was going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself, why don't you? Come down off the cross if you are God's son. Chief priests, the scribes, and the elders also joined in the jeering. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. So he is the king of Israel. Let's see him come down from that cross, and then we will believe in him. He relied on God. Let God rescue him now if he wants to. After all, he claimed, I am God's son. The surgeons who had been crucified with him kept taunting him in the same way. From noon onward, there was darkness over the whole land until mid-afternoon. Then toward mid-afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud tone, Eli, Eli, Labak Shemathabai, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This made some of the bystanders who heard it remark, he is invoking Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran off and got a sponge. He soaked it in, soaked it in cheap wine and sticking it on a reed, tried to make him drink. Meanwhile, the rest said, leave him alone. Let's see whether Elijah comes to his rescue. Once again, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, and then he gave up his spirit. Suddenly, the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, boulders split, tombs opened. Many bodies of saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After Jesus' resurrection, they came forth from their tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. The centurion and his men, who were keeping watch over Jesus, were terror-stricken at seeing the earthquake and all that was happening. They said, clearly, this was the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Out of our uh, four readings for today, I've chosen the Philippians passage, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And it seems to me that there is a connection here to Palm Sunday, but also to what we are going through now uh, with the virus and with uh, people being shut in their homes. Of course, uh, the glorification of Christ that we will get to uh, connects with the hosannas that were spoken of him along the way as he went to Jerusalem. But this past week, I saw a blog on Time Magazine's website wondering if relationships are going to survive people being cooped up together for week on end. In other words, uh, this may breed some conflict. And I think you will see as we go along that it is this sort of issue that this passage addresses, at least in part. Well, having said that, Paul's declaration here in Philippians 2 is one of the most significant passages in the entire New Testament. And I think there are at least three reasons for this. Number one, it contains, contains a foundational statement regarding Christology, that is the doctrine of Christ. This includes our Savior's dual persona as both fully God and fully human, what the incarnation was all about, how Jesus functioned during his three and a half year ministry, his eternal glory both now and and at the end of the present age. All of that and even more. Number two, this passage is significant because it deals with how you and I are to live as Christians, especially as we relate to each other. And then finally, number three, this passage serves as exhibit A of the relationship between theology and practice, that how we live 
must be governed and guided by biblical teaching. I want to talk about, first of all, before we get into the passage itself, its context. This statement here is set against the background of two quarreling women in the Philippian church, Euodia and Syntyche. That quarrel was apparently far from trivial and threatened to destroy the unity and the peace of the entire Philippian body. In this letter, the apostle has already made it clear that the secret to maintaining peaceful Christian unity is humility, which of course is the opposite of pride. And wherever there is contention, pride is at the very least a contributing factor. Therefore, before arguments on either side of whatever the issue may be are examined, humility must be cultivated. How is this done? The answer is seen in the amazing life of Christ. Hence Paul writes in verse 17 or verse 5 that is your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. That word attitude is very crucial because it gets to the heart of what Paul is saying. It's a mistake to think that being a Christian is a matter of just imitating the life of Christ. If that's the best we can do, then it's a cheap imitation. No, it isn't simply a matter of following his example as much as it is internalizing his teaching and shaping one's entire self around his character and take on things, primarily through the, ins the influence of Holy Scripture and the Holy Spirit. Consider Hebrews 4.12 for the biblical side of the equation. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It, that is the word of God, judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now, there are many ways to approach this Philippian passage of ours today, but I want to keep it within context, <coughs> the original context. Therefore, we will first deal with the process of humble peace as seen in the life of Christ, and then consider the experience of that peace in our own lives. The process is seen again in verses 6 through 11, which I will read again. Being in very nature God, Christ did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is what Paul in 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 calls the mystery of godliness, how God was revealed in human flesh was seen among people and preached among the nations. As we break that down from our passage in Philippians, three steps are evident in the life of Jesus. The first we could call renunciation. That is, he voluntarily gave up or renounced his, the right to his rights. I want you to note, Christ did not give up his rights. That was impossible, but he gave up the right to exercise or enjoy those rights. And what phenomenal rights they were. Being God was his essential nature as the second person of the Trinity. That was his divinity. This is affirmed, of course, throughout the New Testament. I'll cite just three instances. John 1, 1, speaking of Jesus, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then there's Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. The Son is the radiance of God's glory 
and the exact rep representation of his being, sustaining all things by the power of his word. Finally, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. <clears throat> but Christ did not consider his rights of godhood as something to be selfishly clutched. Instead, he voluntarily set them aside for the sake of saving us from sin and eternal judgment. Keep this in mind. When Jesus entered our world, stepping out of eternity into time, he could not cease being God. That's who he was. That's who he is. Nothing could change that. But what he did do was to empty himself of every privilege and expression of deity. He gave up his rights to use those rights. This is precisely where humility begins. The readiness to lay aside the rights to one's rights. Paul says he emptied himself. He poured himself out like taking a bucket and dumping out its contents so there is nothing left inside. Likewise, Jesus poured out every right he had to live his life on earth as a sinless man. Of course, we must. Uh, we might ask, well, what about those times when Jesus walked on water, changed water into wine, healed the blind man, raised the dead? Weren't those acts of God? Well, yes, they were, but it was God working through Jesus, the perfect human, rather than Jesus behaving as God. Through this, he reveals that the secret of living as a Christian is complete dependence upon God who teaches us and lives within us through the Holy Spirit. And so the second person of the Trinity became a human, and never once did he speak or act by way of his own inherent godhood. Instead, it was all done in total dependence upon the indwelling Father. As Jesus declares in John 14, verse 10, the words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. However, even that was not enough, but only the first step in the process. If all Jesus did was to demonstrate what humans ought to be, we would have a perfect example but we would be no closer to where we should be or what we should become. And as for dealing with person-to-person -person conflicts, forget about it. So after renunciation comes the next step, which is humiliation. Verse 8 says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus not only gave up the right to exercise his rights, he assumed the indignity, the injury, pain, and rejection of a sinful world, and he did all that without complaint. That's really the key, without complaint. He was obedient unto death, without complaint. Think of it. If Jesus was and is the only, he was the was and is the only person who did not have to die. In John 10, 18, he says, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This is humiliation. And Jesus lived with aspects of humiliation his entire life. He was misunderstood and opposed by his loved ones. Uh, he experienced the insinuation that he was an Ill illegitimate child. 
When he came to the end of his ministry, he was deserted by his friends, betrayed by his own disciples, handed over to a spitting and mocking rabble, and suffered terrible Roman scourging. The crowning indignity came when he was stripped naked and nailed to a cross as a common criminal and outcast of society. Paul uh, wants us to remember that whenever we feel self-assertive and are tempted to angry, angrily and uh, arrogantly uh, break the bonds of fellowship, with, we need to think of Christ. With renunciation comes the humiliating willingness to bear injury and put up with misunderstanding and insults, to live with the cost of someone else's wrongdoing. This is the place to which the Lord Jesus came. And what's especially shocking is this. This lowest place is the place where you and I are to begin. He identified with us. We must identify with him. The third step Paul notes in this passage is exaltation, renunciation, humiliation, leading to exaltation. Listen again to verses 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In his resurrection and ascension, Jesus was given the greatest of all names, the sacred Hebrew name Yahweh. It's the name we call Jehovah and is translated Lord in our New Testaments. What does it mean to be Lord? A Lord has the right to everything he surveys, which for Christ is everything. Paul says that he is the one who, in a sense, has re-won that position because of his, his total and humble commitment of himself to everything involved to securing our redemption. That was the mind or the consuming attitude that led Christ first to human limitation then to humiliation, and finally to unqualified glory. And out of this comes peace. Here's the resolution of the story. Every knee bowing, every tongue confessing, every voice ascribing praise to him above all the created universe. And if you want to complete the picture, go to the closing chapters of the book of Revelation and also to Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, where every tribe, people, and nation gathers around the throne singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. This is both an expression of worship and eternal peace. The result of the work of Christ and the mind or attitude of Christ, which is the same attitude you and I are to have as we relate to others, especially when a conflict of some sort arises. However, a few additional words about conflict need to be said, and that's because we must avoid misapplying this passage by going to an extreme that's totally unbiblical. That extreme is to deny, avoid, or smooth over any and all conflicts without regard to either justice or the truth. Here's the overall approach that we are to follow. According to Scripture, first, when a real and substantial conflict arises, go to the other person and in love work it out. It's what uh, Paul calls in Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. Now, this goes for either side of the fence. If you learn that someone thinks that uh, he or she has been wronged by you, go to that person. If, on the other hand, someone has wronged you, go to that person as well as soon as you can. 
But if the issue is not settled, get someone else involved who can objectively and fairly arbitrate. Don't wrap your ego around the issue, but do whatever you can to bring reasonable closure and maintain the relationship. Of course, sometimes that will not happen, no matter how hard you try. In that case, Paul provides realistic counsel in Romans 12, verse 18, where he writes, As much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Then, as with the unresolved marital conflict cited in 1 Corinthians 7, if you've done everything you possibly can, then the brother or sister is no longer under bondage. Having said this, we must keep in mind that regardless of the outcome, the Christian is to live his or her life as Jesus did, dying to self and living sacrificially. As Paul declares in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Stand if you're able and we will confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate from the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Hear our cry, Almighty God, listen to our prayer. We lift up our eyes to you, Lord God, the one who sits enthroned in heaven, and with our heartfelt petitions. We pray for healing according to your will for all around the world who have contracted this threatening virus. Lord, have mercy. We pray for all around the world who have lost loved ones to this sickness and are in mourning and anguish. Lord, have mercy. We pray for all around the world who are unable to earn an income because of their, their jobs have been suspended. Lord, have mercy. We cry out for the healing and the needed resources. We cry out for comfort and peace. We pray for protection of all medical professionals and caretakers around the world that are attending to those infected with the virus. Christ, have mercy. We pray for all scientists and technologists around the world that are striving to find a vaccine and to make it available to halt the spread of this disease. Christ, have mercy. We pray for all leaders of institutions and governments around the world that they make decisions to try to contain this harmful pestilence. Christ, have mercy. For ourselves, our Lord, we pray. We plead for your watch care over our own deacon, Dr. Jimmy Chua, as he is on the front line here in our city. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. 
We plead for protection, for health, of uh, health for Christ the Redeemer, all churches in our community, in our states, cities, and counties. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. We plead for all to remain calm and kind and to reflect and share the peace of the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Almighty God, you are our rock, our refuge from our enemy, our hiding place. You calm our frantic thoughts and fill our despairing hearts with joy and strength. You restore our souls. We humbly plead all of these petitions through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our, Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Just a few announcements uh, this morning, this Palm Sunday, and uh, we would remind you, uh, as you already know, that this is Holy Week. We have posted on our Facebook page for the church and also sent to you in the form of email a link that would link you to our Christ Church Jerusalem. This is our Gafcon Church in Jerusalem that will be uh, three times a day during Holy Week, presenting us a uh, liturgy and program during this very sacred week coming. And if you would tune into that, there are Pacific times listed, so it would be easy to bring up, and I think that you would enjoy that. This happens to be the very same church that Dr. Chua, Marlene, myself, and Lamia worshipped at in 2018 when we were there as delegates to the GAFCON uh, convention. Also would tell you that we have made plans to distribute it distribute next week on Easter Sunday, Holy Communion. Uh, instructions will come to you by way of email and will be posted on our Facebook page if you would desire to, to have that uh, brought to you next Sunday. From Palm Sunday to Holy Saturday, may God in His infinite mercy grant you a journey of renewal and hope a time of prayer and reflection, and joyful anticipation of our Lord's resurrection. Go now with the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, both now and forever. Amen. 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 Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.